So today I'd like to talk about a few things in particular. The uh, first, uh, first on the list, I'd like to introduce the, uh, a pair of classes that show up again and again in SuperCollider. They are uh, synth and synth def. And we've already been using these classes indirectly. And so we're just going to do a little bit of a translation game uh, and move from this simple function construction, just function.play, into synth and synth def, and just kind of explain the differences there. Uh, then I'd like to talk about uh, envelopes. Envelopes in particular are very useful for giving a, a durational lifespan to a sound. Uh, you know, it's, uh, for example, applying an amplitude envelope. So a sound has an attack, a sustain, some release, and then it's done. Because right now we're in a situation where we just sort of turn on an oscillator or turn on a noise generator, and um, it just goes forever, and we have to free that process, which is just a hard stop and it's kind of musically uh, a bit uh, inelegant. And then uh, after envelopes, with whatever time we have left, I'd like to talk a little bit about iteration, which refers to a family of techniques in computer programming, which allows repetitive tasks to be expressed in a very concise way. And this comes into play, for example, when uh, you want to create some rhythm. Perhaps a rhythm can be expressed as a repetitive structure, or you want to uh, use a, a repetitive process to create a, a stack of frequencies to create a chord. All of these things, there's many things in the world of music that can be expressed as um, repetition with variations. And so iteration comes into play in a very big way. Okay, so to begin, we're going to talk about synth and synth def. And so what I have here is a line of code, s.boot, which boots the server, as we're already familiar with. And then we have a, uh, a ugen function. It's just a function delineated with curly braces. I've named it tilde fn. And uh, this is stuff we already know, sort of. We, have, um, we declare some arguments which allow us to pass values in when we evaluate the function to customize the sound. And basically, you can think of arguments as like knobs and faders that allow you to change the parameters of the sound uh, to which they apply. I'm declaring a variable called sig, which is equal to a sawtooth wave. And the frequency is uh, our frequency argument plus an array containing zero and some other argument called offset. And just as a reminder here, what's going on here is a process called multi-channel expansion. Um, first of all, when we take some number and add it to an array, uh, that addition process gets applied to every item in the array. And so this array ends up being freak, comma, freak plus offset. And that's being used as the frequency to saw. And when a eugen has an array for one of its arguments, it um, expands into an array of that many eugens and distributes the values of the argument to each eugen. So it becomes an array with one sawtooth running at freak and the other one running at freak plus offset cycles per second. And then that stereo signal is passed through a low-pass filter, which also responds by multi-channel expanding itself into two low-pass filters, one for each saw. Um, the value of amp gets applied to both signals in that um, array, so it gets scaled down by a default value of 0.2. And then functions know to output the last expression when we play them. So here I actually... Um, evaluate this function, and this is the syntax we use for passing in arguments. We say args colon followed by an array containing pairs of the, um, the actual, the, the, the argument name, comma, and then the value we want for that argument. So we could also say um, uh, LPF, comma, 3000 if we wanted to increase the cutoff frequency of this low pass filter, and then we go ahead and play it. And right now, our only option is to free that process, which is the result of playing this eugen function. OK, so this is all stuff we've, we've covered and we're just kind of reviewing at this point. So a synth def is actually, if we look in the post window, we can see that I have already been creating synths indirectly. When you play a function that contains eugens, the result of that evaluation is an object called a synth. And a synth represents a sound calculating unit that lives on the audio server. It might be something that generates sound. It might be something which um, simply reads sound from somewhere else and records it somewhere. It could be a process that applies an effect. It's just a unit of sound, you know, like a, a generator, um, a filter, a, you know, this or that. So this whole thing kind of represents 
one synth, and when we play it, we actually create one. And a synth def is an object which is basically a blueprint for a synth. It's not the sound itself, but it describes everything we need to know to make that sound, or to make that synth. And it's very easy to convert a function like this to a synth def. There's just really three primary things you need to do in addition to actually wrapping it in a synthdef.new enclosure. So first things first, we're gonna copy this and we're gonna you know, wrap this in synthdef.new, making sure to close our parentheses as well. So this is kind of the first step. And then from here, there are three things you need to do. The first thing you need to do is give the synthdef a name so that we can refer to it. If we have multiple synth defs, where we have a sawtooth synth def, we have a sine wave synth def, we have a buffer playing, you know, all sorts of different synth defs, they all need a name so we can distinguish between them. And that's the first thing we provide after synth def.new, and we usually provide it as a symbol. And a symbol is this uh, thing here which is preceded with a backslash. So I'm going to call this saw. Okay. So synth def.new takes as its first argument a symbol which will be that synth def's name. Then we have the function, which defines the process. So that's the first thing we need to do, give it a name. Next, we need to explicitly tell the, uh, the synth def or the server or the you know, super collider explicitly what is the signal that you will output. And we don't need to do that with functions because it's a shortcut. And there's a lot of sort of things that are happening behind the scenes, one of which is this function constructs an object which says this, this will be the output signal, the stuff that's highlighted right here. But a synth def makes no assumptions. In fact, you can make a synth def that does not output a signal at all and instead has some other task totally unrelated to outputting a signal. But most synth defs do output a signal. And to tell it what to output, we use a ugen called out. Out.ar, and out needs two things. It needs to know where to send this signal and what signal to send. So for where, we specify a numerical index corresponding to an audio bus. And usually this is zero. I think a slightly more sophisticated and reusable thing to do is to actually declare an argument. Now probably we're always gonna be sending this signal to bus zero, but just in case, we'll give ourselves an argument in case someday in the future we wanna send it to a different bus. And then the signal we actually want to output is called sig. Okay. Let me just take a brief minute to talk about buses and what bus zero actually means. Um, in a DAW, for example, let's say you have a bunch of source tracks, a bunch of drum mics, guitar, piano, etc., and you have some auxiliary track, uh, which is like applying a reverb effect. You can set up an auxiliary send on all of the source tracks and send all of that audio to the reverb track by writing it to a bus. And then you have the reverb effect read from that bus. So a bus is simply a space, a, a location, a thing on your computer, which allows you to write audio to it and or read audio from it to allow different processes to share that signal. And when you, uh, if we open up the meters here, uh, by default, um, I think I already had it a, a couple meters open, so by default, when you boot the audio server, Super Collider assumes that your um, sound card, audio interface, whatever hardware you're using to, pro to you know, convert digital audio to an analog signal, it assumes it has two hardware inputs and two hardware outputs. This is totally configurable. For most purposes, this is fine. Like if you connect an eight channel audio interface with eight outputs, you can tell Super Collider, change the number of hardware buses that output signal to be eight instead of two. Totally configurable. We're not gonna worry about that too much right now. Um, but uh, Super Collider starts counting these buses at zero and just goes up. It has, I forget how many audio buses, I think 128 by default, that's also configurable. But by convention, Super Collider treats uh, hardware, it's, its own buses numbered zero and one as corresponding to your hardware outputs. And it treats two and three as corresponding to your hardware inputs. So if I had a mic plugged into this computer on the, you know, the first mic input of my audio interface, that would be on bus two. And I could read it and then use it in some UGen function or synth def, right? 
there's a lot more to talk about here, and I think we, it's easy to go down the rabbit hole, but we're going to save this conversation for when we start making synth defs that process other signals and sort of actually using buses more explicitly. For now, it suffices to say that zero corresponds to our lowest output, which is almost always plugged into the left speaker, and one corresponds to the second hardware output, which is going to correspond to the right speaker. Right? So that means if we write some signal to bus zero, it comes out of the left speaker. Write it to bus one, comes out of the right. And just for a moment, I'm going to simplify this and take away this multi-channel expansion. So you know, we're just we, we could also delete the argument for simplicity. And so now this is just a monophonic synth def. Um, and actually, let's let's go out of uh, we're in several sets of parentheses here, lecture-wise. We're going to step back out a few. I said there were three things you needed to do. One was give it a name. One was explicitly designate the output, and the third is to add the synth def. So after the enclosure that terminates the end of the synth def, you say dot add, and this actually initiates the process of building the UGen function graph and how the things are interconnected, and it sends it over to the audio server where it lives so that we can actually use it. Right? So these are the three steps. And uh, I've also you know, temporarily made this a one-channel signal by taking away the stereo effect. And now to actually play this, we say synth.new. It's similar to this uh, syntax here, but it is, it is a bit different. So we're, we're going to create a synth here explicitly instead of implicitly. And the first thing we need to do is, just like the synth def, say which one. Right? right now we only have one, but we always need to specify a comma and then an array of arguments here. We don't need to say args colon. We can if we want to, but we don't need to because the second argument uh, the, uh, of synth.new expects an array of values and, and symbols. So here we need to do it because args is not the first, uh, let's see if I can find this, function.play. Yeah, so the when we play a function, the first argument is something called target, then outbus, then fade time, blah, blah, and args is actually last. So we say, forget about all that early stuff. We're just going to talk to you about the args. Here we don't need to do it. We can just put the array without args colon. And so we'll say freak 150, LPF 3000, just to be consistent with what we just did. And uh, that's actually it. There's other stuff, but it's not relevant right now. Uh, this is really all we need to do, and we're going to get our free statement ready. And you can see it's now monophonic, and you can hear it's monophonic. It's only appearing on bus zero because, by default, the value of the out argument is zero, and sig is a one-channel signal. So if I say out one, see, this is why we gave ourselves an argument, because we actually, okay, let's actually send it to the right speaker. Right? There it is. Okay. So let's get rid of this, go back to the default, and make this two-channel again. Okay. So the right, the one channel is frequency, the other one is two hertz higher, right? Because we're adding two to the frequency of the second sawtooth. So the question you might ask yourself here is what happens if we send a multi-channel signal to a single bus. How does SuperCollider deal with this, right? Because in SuperCollider, and really in just about every digital audio software, buses are one channel. You, some, some softwares will do fancy stuff to make it seem like buses are multi-channel, or just conceptualizing several buses as one multi-channel bus. But at least for the purposes of SuperCollider, every bus is one channel. So here we're sending a two-channel signal to bus zero. You could define lots of default behaviors here, but the one that is designed in SuperCollider is it sends the lowest channel, the lowest numbered channel, to this bus. And then says, okay, I've got more channels. I'm going to add one to this value and send the next one there, and the next one there, and the next one there. So if this were a four-channel signal, it would be on bus uh, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Right? If it were an eight-channel signal, 0 through 7, Right? But here it's just a two-channel signal, so the left channel goes on zero, and it's got more channels, so it just puts them on, puts them on one. So we have uh, the left on channel one, and the right on, the left on channel zero, 
and the right on channel one, which is exactly what we want. Okay. And that's basically it for synth and synth def. It's a pretty simple conversion. Name, specific output, make sure to add it. And then we create our synth using this syntax. The question then is, okay, what's the difference? Why do we actually care? Why do we need two things that do the same thing? The answer is that um, the synth and synth def is kind of the more formal, robust, flexible, reusable option. Uh, whenever we uh, play this function, what happens in the background is SuperCollider actually creates a synth def with a temporary name, adds it to the server, and then plays a synth. And so uh, you can see it, the name here is temp underscore underscore 98. Right? And uh, synth defs are pretty small. You know, they don't take up a lot of space, but it's just, um, it's just a little bit messy, a little bit sloppy. And you know this this is a good option if we just need to test something really quick. We don't we're not really like working on a, a coherent, robust, sophisticated piece of music. We're just like I wonder what this would sound like. Okay, that sounds great. Just to be able to play a function without going through this business, it's convenient. But uh, for the long run, it's in your interest to actually go through and, and make the proper synth def and actually specify an output and provide all your arguments, and then you can call synths by explicitly creating a new synth. Okay, so let's move on to the next problem, which is uh, related to the concept of envelopes. And the problem is that we start this sound, it goes on forever. We, we just have to sort of live with it, and all we can do is either free it or hit command period to just stop everything, right? An envelope is uh, a signal in the same way that an oscillator and a noise generator is a signal, but an envelope is a signal uh, which whose who's, uh, sort of trajectory and shape is completely customizable. And almost always an envelope is modeled in this breakpoint manner, where it is a series of lines from point to point, you know, certain, certain values that, uh, you know, the signal sort of moves from value A to value B over a certain amount of time, then B to C over a certain amount of time, and eventually gets to the end. So it's got a beginning, it does some stuff in the middle, and it ends. Most of the time, envelopes control the amplitude of a sound because in the real world with instruments, you know, when a, a bow is dragged across a string or a hammer strikes a piano string or a drumstick hits a drum head, objects go into vibration and sound happens and then that energy dissipates. And so it's, it's, it's a great way to just model sounds. And also music as an art has a time and place and lifespan in time. So envelopes are really, really essential for just giving shape and meaning to your sounds instead of just letting them play on for eternity. So there are two classes that we care about here. One is env, which is just a simple basic sort of numerical class that describes an arbitrary breakpoint shape. And then there is envgen, which is an actual eugen, like sine osc and saw and white noise and all those. This is the object which actually runs you know, on the server, generates samples, and it creates a signal, a digital signal, using the shape of env. So let's first start by understanding the env class. And so we can say env.new. I'm going to put this in a block of parentheses so we can kind of deal with it more easily. And env.new is uh, sort of the one size fits all option for creating an env. Uh, there are other options like specific methods like triangle, which creates a triangular shape envelope, uh, perc, P E R C, which creates a percussive envelope with a very short attack and an exponential decay. Lots of options, but env.new is the choose your own adventure env. Right? We get to say exactly what we need, and there are at minimum three things. Uh, sort of usually what happens is three things, and they are all arrays. The first represents the levels, the points between the segments and the values of those points. Um, the second represents uh, durations in seconds between successive points. And if there are n points, there's, uh, there are n minus one segments. So five, five points means four segments, 10 points means nine segments, right? And then the third array is an array of curve values, which tell the env what kind of trajectory to make from one point to the next. 
And I want to uh, start by just imagining uh, an ADSR envelope. So we're just going to draw one of those. And you've probably all seen these before. But an uh, ADSR envelope looks something like this. It has a peak level. It has a sustain level. And then it has these four segments, the attack, the decay, the sustain, and the release. So let's start by modeling this envelope using env. Uh, let's keep that open, I guess. So uh, how many values in an ADSR envelope? Let's actually, let's look at it. How many discrete points here? Five? Yeah, five, exactly. And, and what are they? Give me some values that might make sense. If we treat peak amplitude as, as the value of one, what would those points be? Uh, zero, one, half, half, zero. Zero, one, half, half, zero. Perfect. Let's do that. Right. And now we have our durations. So we're basically saying how long is the attack, how long is the decay, how long is the sustain, and how long is the release. So, you know, we can... We can just treat this first one as a second. Maybe the decay is also a second. The sustain maybe two seconds, and the last one maybe a second. It's it's you know it's completely arbitrary here. All right. And for the curves, temporarily, I'm going to make all of these zero. And zero means linear. So I'm going to call this envelope E, and then I'm going to plot the envelope. Okay. There we go. We have made a very basic ADSR envelope specification. And just to show you sort of what's going on here, uh, we can make the sustain level lower, like this. We basically drop the sustain level. We can make the attack longer. Now we have a four second attack. And it just, it always kind of plots it on the same initially sized window, but it's all, it's all relative, right? Depends, it's a matter of context. Uh, and let's talk about the, um, uh, the curve values. So zero means linear. It's just gonna draw a straight line from, uh, if this is zero, then the line that's one second long that goes from zero to one is linear, straight line. Positive values curve in one direction. You see how it's starting to bend? It curves, positive values curve a segment such that it changes slowly at first and then quickly towards the end. So you see it's, it's more flat down here and it's more vertical up here. If we make this something like four, it's a more extreme kind of curve. And these numbers, you know, you can go really as high as you like and eventually it's just this extreme, extreme curve where it like basically barely, does, barely changes at all until the very last segment, bit of the segment, and then it jumps up. And as you can probably imagine, uh, negative values curve in the opposite direction. Okay. And depending on what this envelope is being used for, you might want kind of a more logarithmic shape for some things, a more exponential shape, and sometimes a linear shape. Like if your envelope is controlling um, a glissando and it's being specified in MIDI note numbers, so maybe going from like note number 40 to note number 60, it makes sense to use a linear shape there because uh, a, you know, when if, uh, on the piano, if we move linearly, it sounds like a nice, smooth, even glissando. But if this envelope is being specified in hertz, then it makes more sense to do something which is more exponential because the equal tempered scale is a logarithmic representation of frequency. So as you use envelopes and deploy them, it's really important to listen to what they sound like, to hear how the amplitude changes, to hear how the frequency changes, and make sure that it sounds correct and the way that you think it should sound. Right? Don't just always use linear envelopes and say, okay, I'm done with that, great, moving on. Actually listen to how they affect the sound. It's really, that's kind of an important thing in all of music. <laughs> just really listen to it, right? Make sure it sounds right, make sure it sounds the way it's supposed to. Right. Oh, by the way, if you have a lot of windows open, you can always type window.closeall, and that will just close all of the extraneous windows. It's kind of a nice thing. So 
We're going to stick with env.new for now. I do uh, encourage you to browse some of the uh, class methods for env. So here's env.new, which we just saw. There's also all sorts of um, options here, uh, some useful ones. Linn is a linear, it's, it's just like a shortcut for making a three segment envelope with an attack time, a sustain time, a release time. It's always linear. Like I said, there's triangle. Uh, a, a bell curve shape, and dot sign, et cetera, et cetera. So let's actually deploy an envelope inside of this synth def. And we can't just put an env here because an env is not a signal. An env gen is a signal. So we actually need to put an env inside of an env gen. So I'm making a variable. I'm just calling it env. You can call it whatever you like, just like you can call sig anything you like. And this env is going to be envgen.ar. I think I will briefly talk about AR and what this means specifically and just a few efficiency considerations in just a moment. So envgen, the first thing it needs is an instance of env. And so we're just going to take this here, uh, copy it in. We do not need to keep this E anymore. And we're going to close it. And let's, I'm going to make this uh, curve a little bit inward, this one a little bit in the other direction. Obviously, this segment just goes from one value to the same value, so it really does not matter what this curve is, because when you have a point and a point and they're the same, you, you cannot curve between them, right? You can only go in a straight line, so this, this is an irrelevant value. And then we'll do a little something like this. And let's just plot this real quick, just so we can see what it's going to look like. So we got a little bit of a curve going on here. And one second up, one second down, stays here for two seconds, and then back down. Got to remember to take this plot away. And when you add an envelope, it's very important to actually apply it. Right? You can't just put the envelope in your synthep and assume it knows what to do with it. You have to actually implement it. Right? What is this envelope going to do? It goes from 0 to 1, 0.5, etc. It is being used as an overall amplitude control. Right? Uh, it's, it's shaping the amplitude of the sound, and one way we can uh, implement that is by simply multiplying it by our signal. So initially, the value of the envelope is 0, which means initially sig is silent. And then over a second, it goes up to a nominal level of 1, which means sig is going to be at its full amplitude. And then it goes down to 0.5, etc., etc., etc. And keep in mind that there's no limit to the number of amplitude scaling devices we can employ here, right? So we have an, an overall amplitude, which is just kind of scaling the, it's like our master fader. But then, you know, within that scaling framework, we can then scale it again by some dynamic value. For example, this, this envelope, right? So uh, we're done enough to make sound. So let's go ahead and actually play this just so we can really see it and hear it. So here we go. Okay. okay. We could, you know, play it again. And we're free to just make as many of these as we like. This is one thing I really like about Super Collider is the the uh, interpreted nature of it, where it's, you can dynamically evaluate code as it's playing, and it's just a very fluid experience. So that's envelopes uh, in a nutshell, but we've overlooked something extremely important here. So if we bring up the node tree with Alt-Command-T, we have some processes floating around. Right? They're not making any sound, but they are alive and well. They are existing, and they are consuming a little bit of computation power, right? They're using up resources. They're all just generating zeros, just spitting, because that's what happens at the end of this envelope. This envelope just outputs the value of zero at the, at the audio rate. And this zero is, it's so nothing has told these processes to disappear, right? We haven't said free or anything like that. So if we, if we kept doing this, if I just was like sort of lackadaisically just making frequencies and making a lovely little sequence and just having a ball. Eventually, this, this CPU meter would creep up to 100%, and eventually I'd start getting choppy audio. It would start dropping samples and sounding really bad. 
because you know no computer can handle an infinite amount of, of sound. So uh, what we need to do is tell this synth, hey, when your envelope is finished, vamoose, right? Get out of here. You're done. And the way we do that is with an argument called done action. And any ugen, not just uh, envgen, but um, any ugen that has an inherently finite behavior, finite duration behavior. So um, ugens that, that play a sound file, for example, also have a done action because a sound file cannot be infinitely long. It's got a beginning and it's got an end. And so that kind of ugen also wants to know, hey, I'm at the end. What is my done action? And the done action is a value provided to a ugen that tells it what to do with, or that tells the synth that it is a part of what to do when finished. And there is a help file called done. And if we scroll down, we can see uh, a list of done actions. And the way I learned done actions is by number. So there are a total of 16 done actions. We start at zero. Uh, and the only done actions I have ever felt the need to use are zero and two. Zero means do nothing, and that is the default done action, which is why these synths do nothing when the envelope is finished. And two says, uh, tells the, uh, the ugen to tell its synth, free yourself, right? As if we'd say x dot free, and poof, it disappears. So done action is a way of automating this process of destroying a synth when it is finished, instead of letting it hang around and consume CPU cycles. So. The way we do this is um, done action is actually at the end, and we don't want to have to deal with gate, level scale, level bias, all these things. So we're just going to skip right ahead and say done action. The capitalization is important here. Colon two. And that's it. Okay? So uh, this means this envelope is going to play, and then uh, five seconds after it starts, it says, oh, I'm done. I better check my done action. And it's a two, which means free the enclosing synth. So it sends a little message up the, uh, upstairs and says, hey, synth, free yourself. And so it disappears. And let's, let's actually watch that happen as we, as we do this here. So I'm going to hit command period first to just force all of these off the server. And if our done action is ignored, or if it's zero, like this, then have our sound. The envelope ends, but done action zero says take no action. So I'm going to hit command period, change that to two. And let's make this a little higher. And poof. All right, that is what we want. Whenever you have a sound with an envelope uh, such that when that envelope is complete, it means the sound is over, done, period. That's, that's the end. We're never going to need this sound again. Done action two. Very important. If you ignore done action two in certain situations, you end up with a ton of synths, and you say, huh, why is my computer at like 80 or 90% of its uh, capacity? You know? And it's because you've got a lot of synths, which are just taking up space and like you know, working as hard as they can, but for no reason. So that is, um, that's done action two. Uh, there are a couple of other envelopes. I mean, from here you can see uh, you just sort of provide any sort of values, any amount of values to create any sort of custom envelope shape. Uh, there's a couple of other options. Just if you, if you only need something very, very simple, there is line, which goes from some value to some value linearly. Let's say 1 to 0 over 2 seconds with a done action of 2. And this is basically like envelope, but far less flexible. You just get one segment, and it's always linear. Right. You can also do x line, which is an exponential line. And think back to uh, r rand and x rand. And x rand cannot include 0. Right. Mathematically, it just doesn't work. And the same thing is true of x line. So this this will not work. I don't exactly know what will happen. I think it I think it's just silent. So we need to make this some small value. And this uh, it's an exponential line, so you can see it decays quite quite quickly. You can also do something like this: just subtract 
uh, a value of 0.01 from this line. So instead of going from 1 to 0.01, it goes from 0.99 to 0. So this is a way of cheating and getting it to go all the way to 0. We can't really hear the difference. 0 0.01 is such a quiet amplitude that you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's not really worth it. But you know, I think just this, this is just meant to demonstrate that eugens are just numbers. It's just sequences of numbers, and you can manipulate them just like you manipulate numbers. Yeah. Uh, OK, and so before we move on from envelopes, I do want to introduce the idea of gated envelopes, G-A-T-E-D. Some envelopes in the real world, like uh, a bowed string on a violin, there is a sustain level which has an indefinite duration. It depends on how much pressure is being used and musical dynamics. You know, it can be a very quick. It can be extremely slow. Or it can be like sort of, you can have like a half minute or 45 second uh, single bow stroke. Right? Uh, and so our version has a finite, has a known deterministic duration. Every time we play this, it will be the exact same duration. Uh, and that's not really the, the thing we usually do with ADSR envelopes. Usually we want the sustain portion to last, and you know, we'll tell it when to stop, right? So there's a couple of things to do here. I'm going to copy this, bring it down here. So there is a fourth argument called release node inside of env.new. And release node refers to the index of the item in the levels array at which the envelope should pause and hold until told to continue. And so for this, uh, if we add a, add a node here, a release node, we don't actually need a redundant copy of the sustain. Because now it's just sort of starting at 0, going up to 1, going down to 0.5. And that we will specify as the release node, where it stays right there until we tell it to keep going. So we're actually going to delete that, and that, and that. So now this envelope looks like this. It doesn't quite look like an ADSR envelope anymore, but it is. We just imagine that this point can be held for any amount of time. So imagine sort of taking the left half and keeping it where it is, and then just stretching out this right component just as far as we need, right? an indefinite amount of time. And so we then say 2. And 2 means 0, 1, 2, 3. Which item in the levels array is the release node? Uh, release node is a misleading name. It should be like sustain node or something, or sustain index. But it's called release node. We don't really need to worry too much about that. Uh, and so once we specify a release node, there's one more thing we need to do, and that is provide a gate argument for the envelope. So this is outside of the env.new enclosure. Say gate, and make sure to uh, give this a definition as well. We need to actually declare this value as an argument. So it's a, it's a modulatable value, just like frequency is modulatable and offset is modulatable. So gate, we treat this as a binary value, uh, or really just a value that is either positive or non-positive. When it is positive, that tells the envelope go, start, right? And, and as long as gate is positive, the envelope will proceed. And if the envelope gets to its release node and gate is positive, it will stay there for as long as gate remains positive. And when we set gate to be 0 or some negative value, that tells the envelope to continue to its end, at which point it will check its done action, because then it's actually done. So we're going to see this in action here. So we're going to go up one second, down to 0.5 one second, and we're going to stay there forever. And there it is. It's uh, just kind of hanging out at half amplitude, making a sawtooth wave with a different frequency in each channel. And so when we're ready, we say set gate zero. Right? We, we talk to the synth. We say the synth, which is named x, hey you, set the following parameter to the following value. And that closes the envelope gate and causes the envelope to begin its release phase. And then after a second, 
it reaches its end and says, oop, done action two, I'm out of here. Okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm optimistic that that's enough to give you what you need to know to make custom envelopes, make custom shapes, and allow sounds to have a lifespan, sometimes an indeterminate length lifespan, and other times a very fixed lifespan. There are situations where you want sort of, you know, what are called one-shot sounds, where they just start and they take a certain amount of time, that's always the same, and then they're done and they disappear, right? Just, you can just fire those off all day long and never worry about things piling up. And then there are other sounds, like textural drone sounds, which you want to turn on and let them just kind of live. And, you know, maybe you play some other sounds on top of them, and then, you know, when you feel like it, you fade out the sustained sounds by setting their gate to zero. So hopefully that all makes sense. And with our remaining time, I'd like to talk about iteration. <clears throat> and uh, to set this up a little bit, I'm going to modify this uh, synth def. Uh, well, am I? Yeah, I'm, no, I'm going to leave it just the way it is, actually. Let's say we want to make a chord, right? Uh, so I'm just going to like make, uh, I don't know, five or six of these synths. And um, I'm going to, you know, keep an array. We'll call it x. So x is now some empty array. And I'm going to say uh, x equals x dot add uh, one of these. Uh, and I'm going to use MIDI notes here. So I'll say MIDI CPS, very handy method. You give it a MIDI note number, it turns it into the appropriate frequency. And I'm just going to make one of these. So we got a synth, I think. Make sure that works. And then we can say x at 0 dot set gate 0. Kind of the same idea, except I just have an array. I'm storing these synths in the array as I create them. And then I can access them like this. So you know, we'll just copy and paste a few times, make a nice chord. Uh, there is a, I might, this might not be a default keyboard shortcut. I'm just going to dip into the uh, keyboard shortcuts real quick. Uh, I think it is, yeah, copy line down and copy line up. I've made a keyboard shortcut for that. What that does is when you're on a line, you just use that keyboard shortcut and you just copy that line as many times as you need. And I also have made a keyboard shortcut for move line up and down, which I found to also be useful. So it's like maybe you, uh, you copy something and then you want to move it up here. Very handy. So I highly recommend. Um, so I'm going to say, I'm also going to make the amp a little bit quieter here. All right. And so uh, if you haven't figured this out, I'm doing this th in the worst way possible. This is just so uh, tedious and annoying. Uh, well, let's hear what it sounds like. It's a little, it's a little quiet. I'm going to turn these up. And uh, I'm just going to hit command period and do it again. Lovely, right? So then, you know, what do we do here? We have to like, do this. Uh, not working. What did I do wrong? And, X equals X dot add. I think I must have, I'll have to go back and watch the video, but I, I must have evaluated something which disrupted or disturbed or removed the contents of X. And so these messages weren't working. Um, but no, you actually do need X equals instead of just X dot add. Yeah. Because arrays have a finite size, if, if we, here, watch this. Uh, so if I say x dot add one, uh, something like this, it just runs out of space eventually. So by saying x equals x dot add, it guarantees, yeah, it's a, it's a little subtle, subtle trick that comes up. So I, I'm not sure what I did wrong, but it worked the second time and, you know, we'll just, we'll just forget about it. So. Uh, 
oh, you know what I think it was? It's because I added a few and then didn't actually empty out the array. So the, my point is, this is hideous. Like, we don't want to do this. Like, copying and pasting all this line and change, if we want to change the amplitude, we have to change it, you know, six times or something. Uh, it's, it's, it's horrible. So this is why iteration is useful. You want to do something which can be described in a formulaic, repetitive way. You want to use some sort of iteration method. And the first iteration method I'm going to show you is collect. Right? So collect. And collect operates on a collection, usually an array. And we say that collect iterates over that array and evaluates a function once for each item in the array and returns a new collection populated by the results of the function for each of the items in the starting array. And yes, I know that's a huge mouthful. So let's actually look at an example here. I'm going to take this array of numbers. Right? And we're going to collect on this array and provide a function. Now, when we iterate on a collection, almost always we want to actually be able to access the values in that collection inside the function. And we do that by declaring an argument. The name doesn't matter. I usually use n because it's just sort of a, a one-time thing, and I don't need to be typing out a long name over and over again. So I declare an argument called n, and n represents each item in this collection in order as collect performs this iterative behavior. So if I say um, 100 plus n, okay? So we collect over this array, pass in each argument, and return a new collection, and each item in the collection uh, will be determined by this expression. Let's just see what happens. The result of this evaluation is a new array of the same size, and each item is calculated according to what the function returns. So on the first pass, collect says, okay, here we go. First thing, it's 45, so n equals 45, and I'm going to return 100 plus that value. And that's what it stashes in that new array that it's in the process of building. Then it goes again, 55. Okay, that's 155. Boom, right? Da, 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 da. Does this six times, one for each value, and it ends up with a new array. We could say uh, n dot cubed. This is going to be some big numbers. Yeah, so it just cubes each value, right? And gives us a new array. And it, and it actually returns this new array. So here, x is now the result of that evaluation. It's a, x is a new array. We, we start with one array, and collect does its magic and says, here's your result. And it gives us a brand new array, which we have, uh, you know, told it exactly what to do. Yes? It doesn't modify the original array? It does not modify the original array. If I say uh, y equals this array, uh, and then say y dot collect, uh, we can see, semicolon. Uh, y is unchanged. X is our new array. If we said y equals y dot collect, then we would be overwriting our original uh, array. And sometimes we want to do that. Sometimes we don't. Right? So it's, uh, it depends. Do you want to preserve this and use it later? Then you probably don't want to overwrite it. But if you actually want to sort of successively change something through a bunch of collect statements, then um, you can go ahead and do that. So let's, let's put this into practice. What I'd like to do is uh, this, but um, uh, without all of this. <laughs> so I'm going to copy this uh, statement here and uh, just paste it here for a second and then copy this. And we're just going to, I'm going to roughly dump this in here. Right? So we have our array of notes. Right? Notes is this array. And then we can call this like synths. Synths equals notes.collect. N represents, again, each item in the collection, so 45, 55. And instead of 45.midicps, what do we put here? 
n. Yes, we put n. And so on the first time it goes through, it's going to say 45.midi CPS is the frequency of this sawtooth synth. And it's going to return that synth and put it in the first, the zeroth slot in the array. And then it's going to go to 55 and say, OK, what's 55 converted to CPS? Make another synth, store it at index 1, and so on and so forth. OK, so that's like the first half. We have to stop it now somehow, right? And we can do that with another collect. So let's copy and paste. Uh, we don't need the notes anymore. We just need to say uh, synths.collect arg n. And now in this case, n is each synth, because synths is an array containing several synths. So you know we can, we can call it something else if we want. But I'm just going to keep using n, because it's really just an arbitrary name. And we're going to say n.set date 0. OK? So arrays uh, on which collect operates can, be, can contain anything. It doesn't have to be numbers. It could be synths. It could be uh, you know, a bunch of windows, you know, like graphical windows with stuff on them. It could be strings. It really doesn't matter, right? An array contains a bunch of stuff. And collect will just pass each of the things in and return a new collection based on this. Um, in this case, synths.collect returns the, you know, whatever this returns, and a set message just returns whatever it operates on. So what we actually get back out is the same array of synths, which of course are now irrelevant because they're gone. They had done action two and they've disappeared. Um, so this kind of brings me to the other iterative, uh, iterative method that I usually uh, like to tell people about, and that is do. It's almost the exact same thing. Uh, do is almost exactly like collect. It uh, operates on a collection, passes each item in, and you get to uh, declare um, an argument to represent each item. And then you, you know, can write a function, which does something with that item. The difference between do and collect is that collect returns a new modified collection based on the evaluation behavior of the function, based on what that function returns. Do always returns its receiver, it, the thing it operates on. So if, uh, if we go back here for a second, and we say, uh, you know, y is equal to this array, and we say x equals y.collect, each item cubed, x is a new modified collection. This is the value of x. If we do this array instead of collect, do returns its receiver, which is this array. So x, this is completely redundant. In this case, y is the original array, and x is also the original array. Do doesn't actually return a new collection. The purpose of do is, you know, it, the assumption with do is that the stuff that actually happens in this function is the stuff we actually care about. Like maybe we want to actually post the value, right? In which case, like sort of do gives us this side effect of showing us each item in the post window one at a time. What do actually returns is never a useful thing, right? It's if we don't need to return anything from do because we already had that thing to begin with. But collect returns a new modified collection. It's a subtle, subtle difference, but it does come into play up here. For example, uh, we start with these notes. We want to turn them into an array of synths because we want to be able to turn those synths off later. So collect is really important here because we start with an array of numbers. And because the function ends with synth.new, it returns a new array containing synths. That's what we want. When we set, them, set their gates to 0, we don't really need to return anything new. right? All, we're talking to things that already exist. So here, do is perfectly fine. So we can say synths.do, and it evaluates this function and sets each synth's gate to 0. We're not interested in what it returns. We're interested in what it does. The, sort of what its function's behavior is. So here we can say, do this, turn this off, right? Fine. If we do here, we make the synths, but synths is the same thing as notes, right? It do just returns its receiver, so this will not work, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work, because synths is, is an array of numbers, and it doesn't make sense to set numbers gate to zero, right? So 
This is, I think, one of the simplest and most straightforward demonstrations of how collect and do are different. And um, most of the time, you can just use collect. And that's that's fine. Um, like, there's really no harm in using collect where you could use do. But um, sometimes I, I like to use do because, uh, you know, I um, the receiver is not important. Like, do is useful for just doing something x number of times. You might say something like uh, uh, the array. 1 to 100. This is a shortcut for creating the array 1 to 100. 1 dot dot uh, 100 dot do. And you want to post the string hello 100 times for some unknown bizarre reason. Do will, will do that for you. Right? And the thing is, we don't care what do returns. We just care about what happens in the function. Right? And that's basically it. One last subtle thing um, before I let you go. Uh, in, these, in these functions, uh, do and collect, We've already seen that we can declare one argument, which represents the actual items in the collection. We also have the option of declaring a second argument. Uh, we can name it whatever we like. And this second argument represents the index of each item. So what I'm going to do here is uh, post an array of two values, the cubed result of the item, 45, 55, et cetera, and just i, whatever i is, just to show you uh, what i actually is. And we're just going to actually re return this. Let me see if I can format this so that it's readable. Not really. Um, OK, well, you can see that uh, we have, we've returned a new collection, as collect does. And it's populated with the result of this function. And the result is an array containing two things. So here's the first array containing two things, n cubed and i which is the, the index. It's the zeroth item. Then we have n cubed i, the second item, the, well, this one cubed, and its index, which is 1, and this one cubed, which is 2. Right? So sometimes it's useful in these iterative functions to have access to the count. Right? Which number am I on? Am I on the fifth one, or the sixth one, or the seventh one? In addition to knowing its actual value, which is almost always going to be an entirely different thing. So you want to know the value and the index. This is how you get access to both of those things inside of a collect or a do. OK? All right. Well, uh, hope that'll make sense. And uh, I'll, send, I'll cook up another homework and post these as soon as possible. Most of the time, the lectures, they're going up like within 24 hours later because the rendering takes a while. But uh, that's basically it. I'm going to end it here. And feel free to stick around if you have questions. <laughs>